I did a Pastor Mike online one day, if you don't know what that is. Uh, I try my best to beat the devil up every week. So I'll preach, I'll teach Sunday school, preach a Sunday message, preach a Sunday night message, preach a Wednesday night message, and then on Tuesday and Thursday I do a live podcast from Area 52, which is right up there. <clears throat> the aliens are over here. And uh, then when I can, something extra. I started doing things on addictions for some of our people and some of the people that are online and for anybody who deals with addictions. And uh, so I was doing a Pastor Mike online uh, a couple months ago. And I was just, I was shaking. Just nervous, anxiety, shaking. And uh, just barely made it through it. <clears throat> and then I mentioned a few, few Sundays ago, I was dealing with it. Um, not, never really been like this. Uh, I've always tried to be joyful, tried to be the cut up, make everybody laugh. Um, not really let too many things bother me. Um, but it really started when I found out Lisa had cancer. And the thought of, not just the thought of losing her, but that was part of it but the thought of what she was going to go through. Um, one day after her first surgery, it was a Friday, we usually try to spend Fridays together. <clears throat> so she was at home recovering, and I s sat there, and she could tell there was just something wrong. And... Um, so I opened up to her and I, I'm down, I'm depressed, I'm in a hole. So we talked, that helped. But I have bouts, it's not every day, where anxiety kicks in. And I don't know where it comes from. Usually, I can usually tell when I wake up in the morning. There'll be something on my mind, and that'll start the process. Yesterday was one of those days. Today is kind of one of those days. As I mentioned earlier, I know some pastors, good men, names that if I gave you names, some of you would know the names, and some of you would go, really, him? <clears throat> one pastor I know went through a period of about three years. And I, I would listen to his sermons online, and I could tell he was not really himself. He went to see a doctor. doctor gave him some medicine to take, but he just didn't want to take it. So he endured that for, I don't know how long, a year, two years, three years. I don't know how long really, but I, I worried about him because I, I, I thought that would probably take him out of the ministry. Uh, but it didn't. God blessed him. And other pastors that I know that I've talked to who endured this, they go through it. And you wonder why these things happen. If you've ever dealt with chronic depression, which is that's an ongoing, almost an everyday thing. Sometimes people deal with acute depression, which means it only happens for a little while and it goes away. And I'll look at, we'll look at some of the causes of it here in just a little bit. But I've always said, and I've said to this pastor, God doesn't do anything to us but what he wants to use us in that. He wants us to learn something. 
And then he wants us to take that and share that. The Bible tells us that the things that we have learned, we're to commit to faithful men so that they can learn it. The Bible tells us that we're to comfort one another where with the comfort we were comforted with. And so if I, have it, if I had never sinned, I wouldn't be any good as a pastor because I wouldn't know what it's like to suffer the results of sin. I would just be preaching book knowledge without having the experience of it. God doesn't call perfect men to preach. He picks people that he knows he can trust because they know what it's like. I've learned this from other preachers, preaching and being honest about themselves, what they have gone through, what they have been through, what they've had to deal with in life. Some of the greatest testimonies that I've ever heard are from people who wasted a portion of their life living in sin and then God saved them and God brought them out of horrible things and, and changed them. And you, you would, when you see them, if you first knew them as Christians, you would never know that they were like that back in the past. And when they start telling you, you're going, what? Somebody the other day told me that they were on probation when they were 17 years old. I went, what? Shocked me. But that's the greatest testimony. Not necessarily the one who says, I grew up in church and I've been right all my life. And I, I mean, those are okay. But remember, the, the shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 and goes looking for the lost sheep. To bring them back into the fold. So I can only give you the grace that overflows in me. When my cup runneth over, that's when I have something to give you. So I'm going to go through the Psalms. If you know me, you know I tell you all the time when you're struggling with something... Go to the Psalms. They are the medicine cabinet of God. Some of you take medicine from a doctor to deal with the anxiety or the depression that you go through. I have never, I have never told anybody... Well, you're depressed because you got a devil in you or you, you're full of sin or something's wrong and that's why you're depressed. You don't need medicine. You need it. I've never told people that. The human brain is an organ of your body just like your heart and your lungs and your teeth and your skin. And sometimes things don't act right. If it's your heart, then it manifests in certain ways. If it's your lungs, then it manifests in certain ways. If your liver or kidneys or your stomach or your bowels or your bones, they all have symptoms. And so does the mind. When something doesn't work right or something isn't connected right or some kind of metabolism isn't quite there. There are physical reasons why people go through what they go through. And even before I dealt with this, I've always told people, first thing you need to do is you need to go see your doctor. Because there may be something physical about this that I'm not, I'm not a doctor. And don't listen to people who are online who are not doctors. That can be dangerous. Okay? Go see a doctor. First thing. But let me, let me go through the scriptures here. Psalm 4. I want you to follow with me in your Bible. Psalm 4. Verse 1. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in, and here's the word, distress. The word distress has the word stress in it. And depress and stress... And oppress 
Devils, if you are saved, devils cannot take over you, but they can certainly press on you. Am I right? If you've never had that happen, I'll take you to Kenya. And you'll get a load of it. So all of these words, stress, depress, oppress, they are weights that we cannot carry by ourselves. Say amen. amen. So th- one of the best things that I did was to, number one, tell my wife. So she would understand. Now, I'm, I'm not mad at her. I'm not thinking. But there's just something that's not right and I don't have any control over it. Because I can't carry it by myself. But thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Now I will tell you that no matter what the cause of it is. Prayer and Bible reading are an essential part. Of keeping you going. Prayer and Bible reading. Now, Psalm 18, turn there. Mark these verses. Make a note of them. You can go back and reread them. Or if you want, I can print my notes out for you. Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, there it is again. That's the Bible word. So if you have the search software... Just type in distress. Or just in, and with an asterisk at the end of it, so you get all the versions of it. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. Crying's part of it. And let me say to us men, you're not too good to cry. None of you are too good to let tears flow down. When your eyes leak, your head won't swell. Amen? And you don't have to put it on. You don't have to put it out in front of everybody. You can get alone. But get somewhere and cry. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. Some people ask me for magic words to give. I don't have any. There are no magic words that you can say to God and God just fixes you right then and there. So you cry to God. How? How? God help. Like that. It's that simple. And it's supposed to be. When you have a little baby. And the little baby cries. You don't wait until the little baby tells you exactly what they want you to do. You're the mom. You're the one who's supposed to know what to do when the baby cries. God is the adult. We're the babies. And our response to a lot of things is we cry out to God. And God is the one who knows what we need and how to fix it and what to do about it. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. I promise you, your emotions will tell you that God is not listening to you. This is why you have to get your Bible out and read verses like this so the truth will tell you God did hear you. And He always will. Always. Now Psalm 25, turn there. See, I got them in order for you. All you got to do is take a page and turn it to the left. To the left, to the left, to the left, left, left. How many of you have ever heard that? (laughs) Psalm 25, verse 15. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord. For he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Now you think about that. If you've ever dealt with anxiety or depression, it feels like you're trapped. Now sometimes... 
the devil will lay that trap on purpose. He's good at it. And I'm going to get into this in a little bit, but sometimes, sometimes the, your problem with anxiety or depression stems from guilt of something you did that you're, you haven't let go of yet. You haven't, told, you, haven't let, you haven't let God have it yet. Sometimes you're holding on to it. And that will bring guilt, which will bring anxiety. Because you're running, but you're stuck in a net. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. Underline those words, desolate. Because desolation is a I'm all alone word. You're in a barren wilderness where there's no green grass, no flowers, no running streams, and nobody's around. And it's a horrible place to be. Horrible place. By the way, in desolate areas is where dragons like to live. Dragons and serpents and all kinds of evil devils like to live in those places. For I'm desolate and afflicted. Now this is David. David said, I am afflicted. These are the men in the Bible and I'm going to ask you a question here in a minute. We're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you a question to think of somebody in the Bible that you think dealt with depression. Okay, in fact, let's, let's do that now. Father, I ask your blessings on your word. Lord, I'll preach however long you tell me to, or I'll teach it. Father, help me to tell the truth to these people and hold not anything back from them. Lord, I'm glad... It helps me, God, to be able to share this with my family and my friends, my brothers, my sisters. And Father, whatever you take me through, let it be, Lord, for their benefit. Help me to understand the sheep and to know the state of the flocks. So, Father, give us grace. Give us understanding. Help us. Give us wisdom. Help us, dear Father, Lord, to reach out to somebody with this message that may need to hear it. We ask you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, give me a name of somebody in the Bible that you think dealt with maybe a moment of depression, a moment of anxiety, a moment of stress. Somebody in the Bible. Alicia. Jesus. Now I'm going to talk about him. Moses. Moses did. Moses was betrayed by his first cousin, Korah. Moses was betrayed by his own brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam. Moses had the weight of the whole people of Israel on his shoulders. Moses got angry, and instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. He smote the rock. He did what God told him not to do. Moses did. Somebody else. Who? Who? Job. Job lost everything. He lost everything. But God gave it back double. Somebody else. Who? Naomi. Naomi lost her husband, lost her two sons, and was just going to go back home and die. That's what she was going to do. She had no idea that Ruth was going to stay with her marry uh, Boaz and give her a baby back so she could have the land. She had no idea what God was going to do. But God knew what he was doing, didn't he? Give me another one. Mary. Who? Mary. Mary. Jesus' mom. Jesus mom had stood there and watched her son die on the cross. Pam, what was you going to say? Sarah. Yeah, because she watched Hagar have her child. And then when she had her baby, Hagar and Ishmael mocked Sarah. 
made fun of her. So these people in the Bible, they're not the holy saints that we elevate them to. The Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. That means he, in fact, I got Elijah in my notes. Yes, Rose. Noah. Jaden. Joseph. Betrayed by his own brothers, thrown down into a pit, sold into slavery. And then, when he, I mean, he was in good shape. He was in Potiphar's house running the whole show. Then his wife tried to commit adultery with him. Blamed him for trying to rape her, threw him in prison over it. Then the guys that he prophesied the dream for, when they let out of prison, he said, tell Pharaoh about me, don't forget about me. And they forgot about him. Pharaoh and, and Joseph's down in a pit, which is where depression is. Down in a pit. Let's keep reading. Back in Psalm 25. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Now, when I feel the anxiety, there's two nerves that connects my brain to my body. They're called the vagus nerves. They run and connect to the heart, the lungs, and the bowels, and the stomach. When you are frightened or hear bad news from somebody, it automatically goes from your brain and your heart starts beating. You start breathing heavy and you start getting sick to your stomach. It burns. And with me, it burns. And I sat here one day and I was just eat up. And, and there was no reason. Wasn't I told the I told the doctor I said it feels like somebody just told me bad news, but there I didn't hear any bad news. Where is that coming from? I don't know. But it was there. And that's that's what he said. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Sometimes the things we see, hear, think in our mind end up affecting our heart, our lungs, and our bowels. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses, plural. That's why I said put an asterisk after the word distress and it'll give you all of, all of them. Distresses. There may be more than one reason. Look upon mine affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Don't forget that in your prayer. Forgive all my sins. Because you, whether you remember them or not, you did something wrong this last week. Whether you remember it. You did something. You looked at something, thought of something, said something, did something that wasn't right. So God, while you're helping me, take the burden of my sins, the stress and the guilt of my sins off of me too because I can't carry those. Our Savior couldn't even carry the cross by himself. That tells you something. It tells you that nobody can go through this alone. Not even Jesus. Not even him. Psalm 107. I got a bunch of them there. You're going to have fun in Psalm 107. I hit the jackpot when I found that chapter. Came up all cherries on this one. That's a slot machine phrase. And I've never put anything in a slot machine, but I know when, something, when you hit all cherries, you get something out of it. I will say I had a layover in Las Vegas one time going to Portland. And they got slot machines in the airport. And I went, boy, that looks fun. No, I'm not going to do it. Psalm 107, verse 6. And all of these verses are identical. 
God, when God repeats something, it means something. 107 verse 6, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. What, verse 13, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 19, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. Verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Here's what chronic depression is. It comes and it goes. And it comes again. And it goes. And it comes again. And then it goes. And then it comes again. And then it goes. So that's what Psalm 107 is telling you. Now you read, that was the, the, what I just read you are the bread slices. Read the bologna and the meat in the middle. Read what happened to these people. Psalm 107, uh, verse, look at verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. They were in need. They were in want. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. And then it happened again. And then they cried unto the Lord. In verse 11, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and He saved them out of their distresses. I've preached before on the cycles of Christian growth. How everything in everybody here and online and everybody in the world we go through seasons just like we're going through right now. I heard frogs the other night. Sterling? Yes, I did. They had just a little bit early. But I heard some of them. You know what happens when you hear frogs, don't you? They're looking for a girlfriend. Looking for a mate. That's the cycle of life. They do that chirping. They find a mate, they reproduce, now there's more frogs, next year, going to do the same thing again. And sometimes, with some of you, it, cycl it cycles. You get over it for a while, you're back under it. You get over it for a while, you're back under it. You get over it for a while. But here's what's happening. Cut a tree down and look at the rings on that tree. Those rings represent the cycles that you went through in your life. And every time that happens to you, you grow a little. You learn more about God. You get some more favor from God. You, and then the next year, same thing happens again. You learn a little bit more and you're getting stronger. And each time the wind blows and the storms come, you're a little bit better able to withstand them than you were before. Is this Bible helping you today? Psalm 118. <clears throat> Verse 5. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Now, here's what I, here's what I just showed you. In fact, I got one more. Psalm 120. You have to turn left a couple pages because Psalm 119 is a big chapter. Psalm 120, verse 1, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Now, I just read, what, a dozen verses in the book of Psalms where when David was in trouble, when he was afflicted, when he was depressed, when, he was, when his heart was pounding in fear and he cried unto the Lord, how many times did God help him? Every single time. Did God ever reject David? Never. Even his sin with Bathsheba, when God said, the sword shall never depart from your house, the judgment that God laid against David 
was never done while David was alive. He died then after Solomon, the kingdom broke up and divided. David never saw it. But the reason why the kingdom divided was because of David's sin with Bathsheba. But God had so much favor and love for David that he promised him, I won't let you see it in your days. I'm telling you, every time I've cried unto the Lord, he's helped me every time time he's never turned me away and I had it coming and he never turned me away folks now now I'm going to preach the message that was just the introduction I saw you look at the clock I wrote down some of the causes of depression, anxiety, stress, worry. Number one, they could be situational. Somebody died. Or somebody was hurt real bad. Something that you care about. A disaster happened. Or a problem arose in your marriage. Or a problem arose with your children. Or your grandchildren. My goodness, we worry more about the grandchildren than we do the kids sometimes. Ain't that right, Sister Betty? Okay? But it could be situational. And what I just read to you, that's part of the help that you need when a situation arises that causes you anxiety, depression, fear, worry, you're scared, you're afraid something worse is going to happen. Somebody gets sick or they get injured and you're afraid of what could happen to them after that. Those, that could be situational. And here's, here's how I describe someone mourning over when someone died. A big giant rock tossed into a big pond where the water's just still. When that rock hits that water, a very big wave comes up. That's when you first find out that somebody died. A wave hits you of sadness and depression and anguish and suffering and mourning. And you cry. You cry and you cry and you cry and cry. That first wave is always the biggest and it's the worst. After a while, you stop crying. You start thinking, okay, what do I need to do now? And this part of your brain takes over. The logic takes over because you've got to start making some plans. But then another wave comes in. And you cry. And you fear. And you hurt. And you're sick. And then it subsides and you start thinking some more again and start talking. And then another wave comes. And here, here's the thing. When somebody dies, that mourning process is just like those waves. At first, it's rough. And then after a while, the waves subside. A year later, another wave will hit, and you'll weep. Five years later, a smaller wave hits, and you cry a little. Ten years later, you visit the grave, cry a little, and then you move on. There may be little waves come after that, but it does get better. It does get better. And sometimes when that first few waves hit, we can even get angry at God. Because we love them and now they're gone. And God still loves you. I have in here in my notes here the most profound verse in the whole Bible. If I find it, Jesus wept. What was he weeping over? Lazarus. 
and Jesus was within five minutes of raising Lazarus from the dead, but he still wept over his death. Our, I'm telling you, our Savior came down here to live this life and to know why we cry. And I love him for that. Let me get back here. Sometimes they're seasonal. Like I said before, you may have chronic depression and some days are good and some days are not good. There is also what's called seasonal affective disorder. It's basically wintertime. Wintertime is always cloudy, always cold. You're always hurting. When your body hurts, your mind hurts. Amen? When you're in pain, you get depressed. When I was in such pain back years ago, I would get angry. I would be so angry that I hurt so bad I couldn't stand it. And I'd just be mad. Okay? But sometimes seasons affect us. But God always brings spring around, doesn't he? Has, he? has there ever been a year where we didn't have a spring? Has there ever been a year when we didn't have a summer? Now, I'm sorry for you people that live in Hawaii who never have a season. Okay? But here we have them. So sometimes they're seasonal. Sometimes they are physical. I'm serious on this. Your brain is the most complex Thing ever created by God imagine just for a moment the things that the human brain can do that even apes and gorillas and chimpanzees cannot do we are far superior to them and this mind is so complex and structured in a certain way that if something isn't quite plugged in right and let me say this the formative years of a child are the most important times because their brain is connecting things. And if a child is abused severely, sometimes that child never gets things connected right. Sometimes that happens. That needs a doctor. And Jesus is not against doctors or medicines. He's not. They that are whole need not a physician. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Now, I will tell you to be careful. I've seen some that made them worse. I've seen it. Sometimes it's a trial. Let's try this, if that, then we'll try that. Sometimes they get it right the first time and you do okay. And I'm telling you, there are people who are sitting in this room who take medicine. And that you should not be ashamed of. Uh, by the way, I took the medicine that I take so, so I don't sweat. I went ahead and paid the $480, and somebody, one of our online watchers right now, uh, sent us money for that. Thank you. I'm not going to tell you your name. That way God will give you a blessing. But I just want to tell you thank you for that. Because I'm going to be real careful about taking it, because... I don't want to have to spend that again. But see, that medicine keeps me from sweating so much. If you notice, my head is not all blaze red, and I'm not wiping sweat off my face, because I took it a while ago. It's not a sin to take certain medicines, people. It's not unbiblical. It's not wrong. If you need it, let me, uh, uh, let, well, let me get through this. Some of the causes are sin. 
sometimes stuff you did, and if especially if it's not confessed, the depression's not coming from a devil, the depression's coming from God. The Holy Ghost is laying on top of you to where you can't almost breathe, and he's saying, I'm not going to let go until you repent. So repent. Amen? But I will also say this too. Raise your hand if there's something you did a long time ago that you're not going to tell another living human being. Sometimes the devil will bring that back up. Won't he? Won't he? You start nodding your head. He'll bring it up. And that hurts. That's when you go back to God like in the Psalms and cry out to God and say, God, get this devil off my back. Some of them are spiritual. Some of my trips to Kenya have been miserable. My first trip to Kenya was absolutely miserable. The first night I was there, I had devils telling me, get out of here, leave, go home, get on a plane, get out. And I was in such a state of panic, I almost ran and got my wife and said, we have to get out of here, we have to leave. I went, I went with Michael and Mike Hutzel to Kenya and the same thing happened to me when we got out. I could tell it was coming when we were preaching out in Kilimabogo. There was a day that I just stayed in bed on a Sunday because I was just eat up with it. We traveled out to, uh, where was it, Megori? Megori Town? And that night, Michael will tell you, I had him on the phone trying to get me a plane ticket back to the United States. And we were scheduled to preach in Megory all week long. And I was, Michael, get me on a plane. I got to get out of here. And finally it dawned on me what was going on. And I just, I just prayed. And I said, God, I, I can't take this. And I'm not kidding you. I was, the next morning, we were supposed to go out and preach. We all met for breakfast. I was dressed, had my stuff in my backpack. I was going to tell the guys, you guys go get in the van. I'm going back up to the room and I'm, I'm laying down. I'm not going out preaching. And when I stood up, the Holy Ghost said, Mike, go get in the van. You're preaching. That was 9 o'clock on a Monday or Tuesday morning. And that was 1 o'clock at night. And my wife sat straight up out of bed. And she heard, pray for your husband right now. And she started praying for me. God help my husband. And that's when the Holy Ghost said, Mike, go get in the van, you're preaching. This is why we can't do this alone. Nobody can. You're not meant to. Amen? So sometimes it will be spiritual. Sometimes it will be spiritual. But let me say this. I will say that no matter whether it's situational, seasonal, physical, or sinful. Let's say it's a physical issue. Devils are like beasts who can sniff out weakness. Can dogs sense fear in a human? Of course. And they react to it, don't they? Which then makes us more fearful. And then they go, Rah! that's devils. You listen to me. Because no matter what the, the cause of it is, there's always going to be spirits moving in. This is why you have to, even if you're taking medicine, take this medicine. Or you'll never make it. You will never make it. Cry out to God. And take both medicines. Look at Psalm 22. There, here's, here's the example of it right here. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who said that? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season and am not silent. I'm telling you, your Savior knows what it's like to experience the thought in your head that God did not hear your prayers. But God did. So later on in verse 12, look at what happened. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. I'm talking, listen, have you ever fought a bull? You ever been in a ring with a 2,000 pound bull? You gotta be stupid to do that. Brother Ron Dagonia, who is a friend of ours, he rode bulls until he got one horn, went right through him. So then he decided not to ride bulls anymore. He decided to be a rodeo clown. You know, the guy that distracts the bulls so the rider can get off safely. That's still stupid. Suicide. That's why I was always afraid of that man. Because I thought, if a man's not afraid of a bull, he's not afraid of another man. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever had spiritual bulls? And then look what it said. They gaped open, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Who's the roaring lion? And he's looking to devour. This is why you need to put your shield and your armor on. Amen. Now, I've only got like 15 more slides full of scriptures. So I won't give them all to you today. But what do I want to do? Oh, turn to Genesis 32 and I want to let you go. Let me tell you. For those of you who struggle with something, let me tell you. You're the most blessed person in the world. And I'm going to prove it to you. Genesis 32. See, I, I know some of you who are in this room, and I know some of you who are online, that you suffer chronic depression and anxiety. And that may be me. I don't know yet. I don't know how long this is going to last. I will tell you, it helps me to get this out. I'm getting helped now. So thank you for letting me counsel, for letting you counsel me. Thank you for being my psychiatrist. Because I need one. Now look at Jacob. Psalm, Genesis 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. Now you ponder that. This is you, and you're depressed, and you're all alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Who was that man? Who was that man? It was Jesus. Why was Jesus fighting Jacob in the middle of the night, alone? Why was he doing that? And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, Jesus prevailed not against Jacob. Everybody look up here for a second. There are some things that you need so bad from God that you're not going to stop asking him until he gives it. Or gives you better than what you asked for. This right here is better than what I asked for in December of oh, November of 2008. November 2008, I was ready to quit this church and get out of the ministry. And I wrestled with God and said, God, you have to do something in me or I'm going to leave. Because I can't take this anymore. 
and I wrestled with God. God kind of lifted the burden off, but then it came back on, and I wrestled some more with him. I said, God, I was serious. I'm not, I'm not going to stop asking you and wrestling with you until you bless me with something. And the people in Samburu sent me this and gave me this. This gives me the right to speak to their people. I am one of their elders now. And I never asked for that. And that's better than what I ever could have imagined God doing with me and this church. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when it's important enough, you'll wrestle with God until you get it. Amen? Now, look at what, here's what, here's what Jesus did for him. Look at verse 25 again. When he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. He dislocated his hip. That's cheating. Amen. I'll break his leg. Now you won't wrestle. Well, but watch this now. Your depression and your anxiety, or your whatever it is you're dealing with, is your, is your broken leg. Your hip's out of joint. Who did that to you? Who did it to you? God did. God did it to you or you wouldn't have it. And he gave it to you as a gift and I'm going to show you why. Verse 26. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. When it's important enough, I'm telling you, you'll wrestle with God. Even when you're crippled, you'll wrestle with God until you get it. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Somebody say amen. You got, you prayed through, you wrestled, you got the victory. Even though, now watch this. I'm not done with this. And, uh. And verse 29, and Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? I know who his name was. See, Jesus always hid his name in the Old Testament. He wouldn't tell him, I'm Jesus. He wouldn't tell him that. He always hid it, but it was Jesus. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. He blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Verse 31 is here. Here's where the blessing is. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. This is how Jacob walked the rest of his life. And your suffering, and your depression, and your anxiety, or even your sin problem, God crippled you. But he blessed you in that. Because every time you limp now, you're reminded, I wrestled with God and prevailed. God heard me. God heard me. And God blessed me. And you walk now with a limp in your life. Don't you? Say amen. But that's how God blessed you. Because now, you will never, ever, ever give glory to anybody else, including yourself. You will always give it to God. Because you limp. Because you limp. Now, I'm going to let you go. I've got more to preach on this. I'm going to give you examples. I have examples that some of you didn't mention. And I'm going to show you our Savior and what He suffered throughout His whole life so that when we go to Him, He knows what we're feeling. He knows the sickness that we feel and the burning that we feel down in our bowels. Some of you, when you get nervous and get scared, 
You got you to find a bathroom. Don't you? You got to find a bathroom. I've been there. I've been there. Your pastor knows what you're going through too. Because for now, God has me going through it. And I'm glad that we have this place where we can all limp in together and uphold one another's weaknesses. Let me hear God's people say amen. Bow your head. <clears throat> now, if, if you're dealing with sin, then you know the remedy for it. It's confession. I preached, what was it, last week on confession. I did that for a reason. I did that for a reason, okay? I'm not going to say what it was, but some things I just know, okay? I'm not looking at nobody. I'm not saying nothing to nobody. And if you're sitting there feeling guilty, then good. You need to be, because you need to repent. But those of you who are struggling, those of you who are dealing with any of this that I've talked about, your pastor and your Savior and your church knows what you're going through, and we're here for you. So let's, each one of us, in our hearts, cry out unto the Lord this morning.